Good morning, fellow travellers. I'm Rosalie David, and I'm Emerita Professor of Egyptology at the University of Manchester, uh, and I'm the guest lecturer on forthcoming John Bain's uh, Nile tours to Egypt. So today I'm going to have a look at the art of ancient Egypt, particularly uh, the art in the tombs, uh, to see what this can tell us about a disease and medical treatment uh, in ancient Egypt. Now, Egypt had a predictable climate. Uh, this was um, the result of the annual flooding of the River Nile. Uh, and the predictable climate uh, fed through into the art because we have a religious art which reflects this uh, stability. So you get a continuity in the type of art that is produced from around 2800 BC right down to the Greco-Roman period, uh, which is into the early centuries AD. So um, this um, is the background uh, to the art we're going to look at today. Now, Egyptian art is very different from uh, what we might term modern Western art. Uh, when you look at art in galleries today, uh, apart from what is termed modern art, uh, you see the representational art, which shows um, depictions of events uh, or um, activities or portraits. They are lifelike um, representations of uh, happenings or people. But ancient Egypt had a different reason for producing art. Uh, the art that we're going to look at was uh, not intended to be seen uh, by the public or indeed by very many people at all, because it's inside the walls of the tombs. And it's there for a very different reason. It's there for the reason of sympathetic magic. The scenes on the walls were thought to be, uh, it, it was possible to bring them to life, to make them active throughout eternity, to benefit uh, the deceased uh, and his uh, requirements. And uh, this was carried out or made viable by the performance of something called the opening of the mouth ceremony. Uh, in this, uh, the priest on the day of the funeral would go around and touch the figures on the mouth and the hands and the feet and activate them magically so that they would be active then for uh, eternity. So if we look at this uh, representation here, it's a scene from the tomb of Queen Nefertari. Uh, and you can see her uh, in the white dress being led forward into the afterlife uh, by um, the goddess Isis. Now, if you look at the figures in detail, they are very peculiar. The heads are in profile. Uh, the body is to the viewer. And then the legs and the feet, again, are in profile. The arms and the hands, again, are very strange. If you look at uh, the arm uh, of Queen, Nefer uh, Queen Nefertari, you will see that it's back to front. Uh, the thumb is very clearly shown and the fingers. Now, work on this type of art was done by uh, a German uh, scholar. He was a director of the Berlin Museum. Uh, in the early 20th century. His name was Heinrich uh, Schaefer. And he de determined, having looked at lots of examples of art, that there were two types of art. There is what uh, we would call perceptual, uh, what he would call perceptual art, and we call today perspective art. And this is where the, the picture or the image is painted or drawn from the perspective, from the viewpoint, uh, of the individual artist who is creating the work. And this is generally the kind of art we encounter uh, from the 5th century BC onwards, uh, uh, right down until the modern day. The other type of art is called conceptual, or we might give it another term, aspective art. And this is art uh, from the viewpoint of what the object is or the person is, all the elements of that individual uh, picture. And so it's rather more like a diagram of what is known to be there. And this includes all pre-Greek art, 
down to the 5th century uh, BC, um, all ancient art that is. Children's art, because they draw naturally in this way up until the age of three or four. Uh, and then modern primitive art, where the artists have selected uh, to represent <clears throat> the items in this way. Ancient Egyptian art is the best example of this form of art. And Schaefer actually gives us uh, the rules to translate this art and to understand what is going on. Uh, I'd mentioned here that it's not a lesser form of art. It's highly sophisticated and it met, as you will see, uh, the religious and ritual needs uh, of the ancient Egyptians. So the main purpose behind it is to sustain and preserve life and to give the deceased, in this case, um, uh, a means of living on into the next world. So if we look at the figures then with this different viewpoint, um, if the face had been shown frontally, uh, you would lose uh, the nose and therefore this individual would not be able to breathe. So it's shown in profile, then the torso, the body, uh, the uh, shoulders are the symbols of strength. So it's shown frontally to the viewer to preserve this strength. The legs and the feet, again, you need to have them in profile to ensure that both legs and both feet are there for the owner's use in the next world. And the same is true for the hands. Uh, this hand is shown with the fingers and the thumb, because if you were to show it nat naturalistically, the thumb would fall down behind the fingers, would be invisible and therefore not of use to the person in the next world. You'll notice that um, one of the pair is represented, one eye, one breast, and uh, in reality, the Egyptians believe that the pair uh, would come into reality, would come into existence uh, in the next world. So this art is, as we've said, um, continues for literally uh, thousands of years. And uh, the reason they were able to keep it in this format is that they drew it up on a grid uh, with a canon of proportions. So there's always the same distance between the top of the head uh, and the, the neck, uh, the shoulders and the, um, uh, the waist, and the waist and the legs and so on. And here you see a two moaner and his wife again in this uh, profile on a preliminary grid where they were planning out uh, the scene. Notice, interestingly, that he is holding a vase, but his hands are not around the vase because then uh, the fingers would have been lost at the back of the vase. So they're shown in this completely uh, incongruous way. Uh, in earlier times, um, we've just looked at an example of the New Kingdom, about 1500 BC. If you go right back to uh, around 2800 BC, then instead of a grid, you've got these, these lines that go through the figures uh, and keep them uh, in this, this way. Uh, this grid, uh, the, the canon of proportions and the uh, details I've mentioned um, are shown when we're representing the elite figures, the two owner, his wife and their children and other members of their family uh, or um, their guests, their visitors. If you're looking at the non-elite, the people who serve them, sometimes these rules are relaxed. And you can see here uh, on the left-hand side, uh, the figures with the donkey. And the man is beating the donkey on the back, uh, and his arm is across uh, the shoulder. So he's, uh, they're, they're going away from the rules here, because normally, of course, you would have to show the whole torso with the shoulders intact. Now, we also have scenes of um, animals uh, where they use what is almost a cartoon system. So here we can see at the top animals uh, jumping up into a tree and the animals on the top, you really need to read this, that they are at the back of the tree. But if they were shown in that way, uh, they, would, they would be lost uh, in the uh, reconstruction, the bringing to life of the scene. 
In the middle scene, you have the animals again at the top of the bush, but the baseline is given under each one. And then in the bottom, you have to learn to read this as animals going around a bush in a, more or less a cartoon strip. And on the other side, we have an image of a, a quail chick, the rear portion of a quail chick, showing that this grid system is applied to animals uh, as well as uh, humans. Now, <clears throat> Schaefer wrote a book, uh, which is the, um, the seminal work on this understanding of Egyptian art. And this is a page from that book. Uh, all the examples here, except one, are ancient Egyptian. In the top two, you have, <coughs> excuse me, a lake uh, with trees around it and um, a fence, and then a gateway, excuse me, which is shown on its back. So what the artist is doing here is giving a diagram of what is known to be there, because then all these elements will be recreated for the owner's use in the next world. But there was a limitation of wall space. And so on the other side, we have what appear to be two men uh, dipping into a lake to draw water. But this is really one man doing two actions so they're brought together in the one scene. The other thing to notice here is that the stretches of water are not at baseline. Uh, they are um, brought up through an angle uh, of um, 90 degrees and they're shown as a plan because this meant that all the water would be available for the use of the owner of the tomb in the next world. Schaefer also talked to a lot of uh, school children, and uh, you can see here in the centre um, their, their reasoning as to why they uh, draw and paint in this way. They give a, di a diagram of what, you, what they know is there. So there's a pond surrounded by a path, by a gate with a, uh, with a fence, and then a hedge around the outside. So this is exactly the same as the Egyptian drawings but done for different reasons. The child is giving a plan of what it knows is there. The Egyptian is giving a plan of what needs to be brought <clears throat> into actuality uh, in the next life. So when we go <clears throat> on the tour, we will visit the site of Saqqara and see some of these very early uh, tombs going back to around 2800 BC. Uh, this is one example where uh, men are shown fishing uh, and you can see at the bottom the river Nile um, or the, the canal from the Nile is not shown as a thin blue line. It's as if you've got a slice through it so the fish are visible. The same with the, uh, the representation of the, uh, the birds. The front of the carrier is removed so you can see the vision of the birds here. The idea being that these creatures will on, only be um, brought to life, only be present uh, if uh, they are visible uh, within the scene. By the way, notice here that the background is cut away and the figures stand out from the scene. This is something known as bar relief uh, and it's the most difficult way of carving um, uh, as opposed to relief on career, which we will see in some of the scenes where the figures are incised into the surface of the stone. After the carving was done, uh, then paint was applied uh, to the surface of the figures. Now, there is a different way in representing humans and animals. Uh, this is um, a scene of a nobleman uh, in the, um, the, the tombs in the tombs of the nobles of Thebes, again, which we will uh, be visiting the area. And here you have the tomb owner, Usahet, hunting in the desert. Now, he is shown very rigidly, as are his pair of horses, but the animals on the right-hand side are full of movement and life, and the artist is free here to show that they can and did paint uh, realistically when they were 
slightly removed from these uh, religious conventions. So what is being presented here is an idealized world. Uh, this is a complete tomb, uh, belonged to um, a, a noble uh, in the New Kingdom. Notice here that the scenes are shown painted onto the wall. The stone in this area of the country is not good enough to carve properly. So instead they plastered the walls and then painted them uh, on the flat surfaces. So in this tomb, uh, the tomb owner would be able to tune in to the activity shown on the walls of the tomb, almost like television programs. And you read the registers from top to bottom. So they are like cartoons where there is a, a sequence of actions from the top to the bottom. On the end wall in front of you, you can see the offerings being made to the dead person. And there is a menu on the wall a list of the food and drink offerings that they would uh, be able to access and uh, imbibe and enjoy throughout eternity. When you look at the scene showing the tomb owner and his wife, they are shown uh, as larger than the other figures in the tomb. So this is where it breaks away from perspective. If you had a perspective drawing, the largest figure would be the one nearest the artist. Here, the largest figure is the one that is most important in terms of status uh, in the tomb. Again, we have representations here of size. Um, if you think the little serving girl here um, is, is very out of proportion to the guests at the banquet that she is serving, if she were to stand up, she would be, um, if they were to stand up, they would be probably three times her size. But she is shown as small, uh, and they are larger because of the status difference. Um, she is shown uh, with some physical, um, um, not abnormalities, but uh, difference from being an idealized figure in that she has rolls of fat. Uh, her arms are shown across her body. She's wearing very little clothing. These are all um, symbols of a lower status. And notice also that her feet are on a lower level than those of the ladies. Another interesting point here is that the Egyptians never showed crowds or different individuals. If you have three figures shown together and they have identical faces, uh, this indicates a crowd, a group, uh, in this case, at a party. This is the only known example in Egyptian art of uh, a figure giving the back to the viewer. Here the artist has been able to experiment to some extent uh, because this is uh, a serving girl and not one of the elite owners of the tomb. So here you have a head in profile, uh, the figure giving the back view, and then the legs and the feet again in profile. And uh, this, of course, is an impossible stance. It was obviously an unacceptable visual um, uh, element as well. And so it is not, um, it is not uh, um, repeated elsewhere. Now, there's some interesting um, scenes of the scenery. Here you have the two Mona and his wife, and they have um, a pond in the garden of the house. Uh, you can see at the bottom on the baseline, where the pond is, there's a little uh, rectangular indicator of uh, that it is at ground level. But it's been turned through an angle of 90 degrees, so you've got an L-shaped lake, and the water here is defying the laws of gravity, jumping up into the hands of the two Mona and his wife. Because remember, if the blue line was a thin blue line, there would be insufficient water for them to enjoy uh, this throughout eternity. The two owner and his wife are here seen hunting uh, and fishing in the Delta marshes. Um, some interesting points here. Um, all the elite are shown as young uh, in their probably their early 20s, uh, good looking according to the, uh, the criteria of the day, uh, and uh, also without any physical 
disability. And this is very important for our use of art uh, as a source for Egyptian medicine and disease and disability. So the elite are never shown with these physical disabilities. And here you have the tomb owner uh, shown as a young man, uh, his wife slightly smaller behind him, and then their child is down uh, holding on to the father's leg. Now, the father might have been about 60 when he died, uh, and the child might have been about 40. Uh, but the um, the reality they show here is of a young family, because that's what they wanted to be recreated, reproduced uh, in the life after death. But when you turn away from the elite, you can get some very interesting um, scenes uh, of what was going on uh, in everyday life in Egypt. This is from another New Kingdom tomb, and it shows um, a barber's out-of-doors um, shop. So in the upper register, remember you read from top to bottom, uh, the men are waiting in the shade of the tree, uh, their turn to uh, be uh, attended to by the barber. In the lower scene, the barbers have their clients with pots on their heads and they're trimming their hair. Uh, so this is a, a sort of um, a glimpse into uh, the the way of living at the time. Uh, a point here, they, they never show landscape in the, the way you get in later art. Uh, a tree or a few uh, plants or bushes suffice to show that it is out of doors. Uh, a few pieces of furniture uh, will show that the activity is taking place uh, indoors. Again, sometimes amongst the um, tomb scenes, uh, we have representations of real life. Uh, they all ate and drank a great deal of alcoholic beverages, and undoubtedly there was, uh, there was um, sickness um, uh, at the parties, but this is never shown for the elite. But here, amongst the musicians, uh, these girls are employed and so are servants for the tomb owner. This little girl in the middle is being violently sick. She's vomiting. And in the inscription that goes with the scene, uh, she's saying, um, uh, I want more to drink. So although she's drunk, she's asking for uh, further, uh, further drinks. Again, uh, with the... Um, uh, the um, non-elite. Uh, here we have uh, the fighting force uh, in the tomb of uh, an army general. And it shows that they are very overweight. And this would have been a feature of many Egyptians who couldn't be shown for the elite. But here they are, as you can see, uh, very, very overweight. It's interesting that they use the colouring, uh, the tones of dark and light brown, uh, not to um, identify the exact colour of these men's skins, but to make the figures visually stand out one from the other. There's enough evidence from unfinished or partly completed tombs to know that um, a workforce completed the tomb. So there may well have been a man to do the heads, another one for the bodies, and another one for the legs. So sometimes you get uh, an inconsistent number of legs for the number of bodies. I think they're all right here, but it's always something that's uh, worth looking out for. Here again, amongst the non-elite, we have a representation of um, old age. Uh, the pelican keeper shown here uh, has thinning, graying hair. He's pot-bellied. Uh, he's calling his pelicans in at the end of the day uh, in the inscriptions. Uh, the, uh, the eggs are piled up on top of the containers, this idea that uh, these are only will become activated, fully, fully visible, and therefore fully present for the tomb owner as a food source uh, in the next world. And again, we have uh, amongst the non-elite, uh, these men are trying to drive their, uh, their animals with a plow, and they're being very obstinate. And so the hieroglyphs um, uh, give the scene, the title of the scene, but then the, the swearing of the men as they try to drive the animals forward. Uh, the pictures and the hieroglyphs are both an integrated element of the scene. Uh, the hieroglyphs give you 
uh, the uh, the title of what is happening, and then, if you like, the balloons or the conversations of the individual uh, people uh, in relation to each other. Now, um, we can come on to look very briefly at uh, the pigments. Uh, they use generally um, uh, the basic pigments, uh, but sometimes they did mix colors. Uh, the pigments are uh, all um, uh, from derived from um, organic uh, material, inorganic material. They had um, uh, sort of charcoal for black. Uh, they had gypsum for white, uh, the ochres for uh, red, brown and yellow, and then copper carbonate uh, for the green blue shades. So, and then they used other uh, other dyes as well. And uh, these were frescoes. The paint was mixed with water and then applied to the uh, onto the plaster. So here we have an example of a, a, a monkey taken along to a party. He's tethered to the owner's seat and he's eating from a basket of figs. Notice the figs are piled up on top of the container. And here the artist has used a mixture of pigments. So he's um, he's got grey for the monkey's um, uh, skin and a pinkish tone uh, for the for the figs. The Egyptians were really at their best when they were representing animals in art uh, because they were able to be free of at least some of these restrictions that were applied to the elite in the tomb art. This is a famous example uh, from uh, Meidum, uh, from a tomb there, and it shows uh, what are called the geese of Meidum, the Egyptian geese, and they represented their animals so uh, meticulously that modern ornithologists can identify uh, most of them, nearly all of them, from these scenes. So here again, you see the representation <clears throat> that this is happening out of doors with a few bushes uh, to indicate this. Now, <clears throat> another scene uh, in um, the um, tombs at Beni Hassan, uh, this is Middle Kingdom, so halfway between the Old Kingdom and the New Kingdom. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and here you've got us a range of birds. Um, you can identify the hoopoe, I'm sure, here on this scene. But at the top, there is a bird with its wings held out, and then the wings are closed against its body. And this is another example where two actions are brought together in one uh, scene because of space restrictions. Uh, but it's almost like a, 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 a double shot of, of what is happening. And in detail, again, you've got a, a, um, a small corner of the scene of the tomb owner and his wife uh, out in the marshes. And here we have um, the, uh, the animals they took with them, their pet goose, and uh, a, a family cat who, uh, it seems, was trained to catch birds in its mouth, uh, in its forepaws, and even under its tail. And notice again the, uh, the um, water. We've got a section here of the water with the fish shown uh, inside. And then some of the details. Um, this is a detail from another uh, tomb of the New Kingdom, and uh, it shows uh, figs, it's a um, sycamore tree, uh, and the birds are pecking away at the tick, at the figs. But it's really beautiful because of their use of color, these soft grays, uh, and the green, and the dark green. And then in one tomb, uh, which belonged to the overseer of the king's estates uh, in the New Kingdom in the reign of Amenhotep II, um, the whole ceiling is irregular. And so this has been plastered, the rock has been plastered uh, and then painted. So when you stand in it, it's as if you're standing underneath a vine. And this is just a very small section uh, of that ceiling. And again, I think you can see their, um, their excellent uh, way of um, showing design. I mean, they have really uh, high skills in this particular area. So then we come on to... Um, um, scenes in the Valley of the Kings, and we will be visiting uh, some of the scenes here in the Valley of the Kings. 
some of these tombs are incomplete. So we can see the order in which the scenes were completed. From the point when the king died, two had to be put into use and no further work could go on. Uh, so here, this is um, an example showing uh, the king with the god Osiris, uh, and the artists have completed uh, the face uh, and the insignia and the uh, the crowns and the hieroglyphs are here in place. The colour, for the most part, has not yet been applied. So this is something again to look out for uh, the the way in the order in which uh, these things were um, prepared and developed. So the men who um, uh, built um, and cut out from the rock and then um, decorated the wall scenes of the royal tombs uh, lived here in a town called Dero Medina. And Dero Medina was lived in for about 400 years by this uh, royal workforce and their families. And they would work on the royal tomb for um, eight days at a time. Then they would go back to the, the village to their families, and while they were there, they would sketch uh, for their own entertainment, and these were thrown into the rubbish heaps. So what we're going to look at very briefly is a set of scenes that have come up from the rubbish heaps of this town. But just while we've got this image on, um, I'd like to say that there, in some of these houses, there are birthing scenes painted on the walls, and it's clear that the the women of the town were delivered in childbirth within these birthing chambers um, in, in the house itself and on the flat roof of the house. So this is one example where we do have an artistic representation of um, a, a medical situation or treatment. So these are some of the scenes. Um, there are a series called the Satirical Ostraca, uh, ostraca um, are potsherds or uh, flakes of stone uh, on which uh, scenes are drawn or painted. And um, so the satirical ostraca, um, in the plural, uh, show um, what may be a political situation where the um, nobles are shown as mice and the servants are shown as cats. Here you've got a mouse noble uh, and the cat servant is fanning uh, the small duck for him uh, to eat. So is this a way of saying they may think that they're the upper classes, but really we've got the power because within our hands uh, we have the ability to ensure that the king's tomb is or is not completed at the time of his death. And another one of these, this time again showing a mouse snowball seated drinking uh, from a, a, through a straw from a container of liquid. And then you have the cat servants, one uh, um, dealing with the, the liquid vase, the other one uh, hairdressing uh, the mouse noble. And then this um, famous scene of a dancer at um, Dero Medina. You see here the wonderful sweep of the body, uh, the only... Um, giveaway that it's rather more rigid is that the earring is stuck very firmly uh, on the cheek of the dancer. So from those two sources, you can see that there is not a lot of evidence uh, in the way of uh, disease or um, uh, even treatment. Um, sometimes in the um, art, uh, we do have uh, some evidence, um, uh, such as industrial injuries, possibly, where uh, men are shown working on a building site, and one man seems to have something uh, lodged in his eye, <clears throat> and another one is trying to extract it. There are occasionally indicators of what might be um, uh, medical emergencies or medical situations and treatments but they are extremely rare and they are shown, as we've said, with the non-elite. Now, at the very end of Egyptian history, the Greco-Roman period, uh, the Greeks and then the Romans, uh, in some numbers, 
um, went as um, migrants to Egypt and they, uh, they became immigrant communities uh, in uh, certain places in Egypt. Uh, these were veterans to some extent of the army and families who wanted to go and live uh, in Egypt, which was a very pleasant uh, place to, to reside. And they, in many cases, adopted uh, the practice of mummification, which was Egyptian, and adopted the Egyptian beliefs of the afterlife, which with the idea of this idyllic, idealized afterlife where you went and lived then for eternity was a lot more pleasant than the one uh, that pertained either for the Greeks or for the Romans. So when they adopted this, they were then themselves mummified. And in the Roman period, they were set there for several, several hundred years, uh, they brought in the idea of portrait painting, uh, panels uh, that were painted probably in the owner's lifetime and then placed over the face of the mummy uh, at the time of uh, death and mummification and burial. So these are a very interesting group. This is an example in the Manchester University Museum. Uh, most of these individuals in the portraits are shown as young and beautiful because, again, this is the idea that you want to go on in the next world uh, as um, a perfect individual. You've noticed that they've moved away entirely, however, from the, uh, the way of representing the human face. These are now in the tradition of Greek and Roman painting, and they look quite similar to examples in the houses at Pompeii. They're shown fully to the front. There's use of um, shading and highlighting, and uh, they are the beginnings, really, of what we would term uh, Western uh, art. But some of them may show uh, hints of um, illness. Um, some of them certainly show people who are slightly older. So there's a mixture now of um, not showing disease in the elite, possibly showing some indicators of it. Uh, some of them look rather wan uh, and um, depressed. And then uh, some of them where they are shown really as uh, older individuals. They are more realistic. So this is the um, very brief overview of uh, Egyptian uh, religious art uh, and um, how it can contribute uh, to our understanding of uh, disease and medicine in ancient Egypt. So basically, we're saying that although there is some evidence from the non-elite uh, for medicine, uh, medical treatments, uh, and for illnesses, this is not true really for the, uh, for the elite. Uh, generally, the art, as we've looked at it today, is not a reliable source for disease uh, or for medical treatments. Uh, and for uh, those, in order to give us a much better understanding uh, of um, disease and deformity and treatment in ancient Egypt, uh, we resort to the documents, particularly to the 12 medical documents, the medical papyri that represent uh, over 3,000 years of Egyptian history and therefore must be the tip of the iceberg. There would have been many more that were uh, either uh, destroyed or lost or maybe in uh, museum and library collections which remain as yet unidentified. And then the major group and what our work in Manchester focuses on uh, is of course the human remains. Uh, the human, uh, both the mummified and the skeletal remains that can now be examined with a whole range of uh, medical and scientific techniques to give you a, a, a major understanding of what was going on in terms of the, uh, the daily lives of the Egyptians, their uh, diseases, their causes of death, uh, their diet, uh, their disabilities. Uh, and um, we can put together a really quite a convincing picture. There are gaps, but quite a convincing picture of what was actually happening in the everyday lives of the ancient Egyptians. And uh, this book, which is the 
uh, four stone, um, looks at these medical and healing practices in ancient Egypt, uh, not just the, the doctors and the role of the temples in that, but also um, uh, the midwives, uh, the nurses, uh, the, the vets, um, the reflexology, possibly the whole range of treatments that were available to the ancient Egyptians. And this is published by Liverpool University Press and will be coming out in December 2023. So on that note, uh, I hope to meet up with some of you uh, in the forthcoming tours. And I hope this has given you just uh, uh, um, an inkling of what you can expect to see uh, and to learn about uh, when we go to Egypt. Thank you very much.